Greetings and welcome to today's program. Um, Professor Larry Jacobs, I am in the Humphrey School of Public Affairs and I work on politics. Um, I also direct the Center for the Study of Politics, which is very pleased to be partnering with the College of Liberal Arts Department of Economics and the Public Life Project to make today's event possible. Today's speaker is Professor of Economics, Glenn Lowry, who joins us from Brown University, where he holds the Merton P. Stoltz Professorship of Social Sciences. Professor Lowry joins us at a remarkable moment in the country and here in Minnesota. Um, he joins us in the wake of George Floyd's murder, um, wake of the outrage here in Minnesota, around the country, and really around the globe uh, regarding racial disparities. And he joins us with a remarkable career um, in, in terms of his research. He's done seminal research, raising questions about affirmative action, themes in his research, recognize anti-Black discrimination, but he's also raised and made the case that the behavior among some Blacks uh, is dysfunctional um, and has prevented some Blacks from seizing newly available opportunities. He's made the very plain case that um, some Blacks need to take more personal responsibility for their behavior. He's also recognized, as he's made those arguments, the need for collective responsibility for what he describes as America's tragedy. Glenn Lowry's research and his public comments demonstrate that there's not one script on the issues and debates around race, racial disparities, and the remedies for those. He's pursuing research and stirring debate that raises difficult questions. And this is evidence of a vibrancy in America. It's not evidence of individuals being bad or flawed um, and somehow uh, being counterproductive. This is exactly what we need in America. We're uh, hosting uh, Glenn Lowry's research and debate over comfortable, uncomfortable issues and contentious topics. I applaud the hosts of today's programs, and particularly the College of Liberal Arts Dean, John Coleman, and my good friend and sociology professor, Doug Hartman, who directs the Public Life Project, which is bringing us today's uh, program. They are modeling the needed respect for contrarian views at the University of Minnesota, and so today's event is most welcome. Following Professor Lowry's talk today, he will be joined by my colleague, um, University of Minnesota's Professor of Economics, Christopher Phelan. And Professor Phelan will be leading a question and answer with uh, Professor Lowry. Um, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. Give us your questions. It's really important for the conversation we're gonna have today. Challenging questions, most welcome. So uh, become part of the conversation today. So without further ado, I wanna welcome uh, Professor Glenn Lowry uh, to Minnesota and to uh, present uh, his talk today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Larry. Um, it's good to be with you. I'm just gonna jump right into it. I'm uh, very honored to have been asked to give uh, this lecture on the persistence of racial inequality in America. Why, I ask, the success of the 20th century civil rights movement notwithstanding, has Blacks' unequal status in American society persisted into the 21st century? To think clearly about this difficult problem requires us to distinguish between the role played by anti-Black discrimination past and present, and the role of behavioral patterns to be found among some Blacks. I admit, this puts a very sensitive issue starkly. I wish to chart a middle course here, acknowledging anti-Black biases and insisting they be remedied while 
urging that we also identify the behavioral patterns that may prevent some people from seizing newly opened opportunities. I'm gonna begin with a provocative claim. Structural racism about which we hear so much these days is an empty category. The phrase is used as both a bluff and a bludgeon. It's a bluff because it explains little while in effect daring the listener to notice. For example, when someone says structural racism is the reason why there are so many black people in prison, a listener is being dared to reply, no, perhaps it's actually because there are so many black criminals. And it's a bludgeon because its use involves rhetorical intimidation. Having demonstrated few cause and effect processes, it insinuates shadowy causes that are never fully specified. Everybody's simply supposed to know that racial disparities are the fruit of something called structural racism embedded by an environment of white privilege, supported by that ultimate bugaboo, white supremacy. George Orwell would have recognized this kind of talk as a version of his new speak, that is using ambiguous and euphemistic language as a subtle form of political propaganda. History, I must say, is rather more complicated and more interesting than these just so tales would have it. The outcomes of concern here in the labor market, in the schools and in the criminal justice system have multiple interacting causes. People who insist that structural racism explains these disparities do not make arguments. Instead, they evince a disposition. They call us to solidarity while soliciting our fealty. They, make, they seek to compel affirmation of their systems of belief. In this lecture, I will sketch an alternative account. Now I warn you, I'm an economic theorist, first and foremost. So my focus here will be conceptual, not empirical. We economists need to specify an appropriate model for understanding long enduring racial economic disparities. And I aim to contribute toward that objective in the remarks that follow. As you will see, I do not mince words. I wish to draw attention to a contrast between two causal narratives, the bias narrative, which argues that the root cause of persistent disparity is found in anti-Black racism. And since racial discrimination causes racial inequality, it follows that we must reform society to achieve a level playing field. The focus there is on the demand side of the labor market, for instance. I think such reforms are necessary, but not sufficient. By contrast, the development narrative is concerned with how people acquire the skills, traits, habits, and orientations that foster their successful participation in our society. Its focus is the supply side of the labor market, and its premise is that those who lack the experiences are not exposed to the influences and do not have access to the resources that foster and facilitate their human development will, in general, fail to achieve their full potential. These two narratives, bias versus development, need not be mutually exclusive, of course. What is clear, however, is that they point in very different directions in terms of intervention and remedy. This tension between a focus on the demand side and the supply side factors to account for racial disparities is a very old theme for me. It is what led me to coin the term social capital in my doctoral dissertation at MIT. In doing so, I was contrasting that concept, social capital, with the more familiar notion of human capital. As you may know, human capital theory studies inequality via a conceptual framework that was initially developed to explain investment decisions by firms that focused on formal economics, economic transactions. I thought this framework was not adequate when applied to explaining persistent racial economic disparities. I believe my concerns then remain relevant today. I'll use some of my time here to explore these ideas more fully. My basic point was that associating business with human investments is merely an analogy and not so good an analogy at that when thinking about persistent racial disparities. Business investments are transactional. Human investments are essentially relational. So important things are overlooked in the human capital approach, I thought. Things having to do with informal social relations. Conventional theory was incomplete when accounting for racial disparities, I argued, and there were two central aspects of this incompleteness. 
This led me to make the following two observations. One about the dynamics of human development and the other about the nature of racial identity. I wish to reiterate these observations because I believe they remain relevant today. My first observation was that all human development is socially situated and mediated. The development of human beings occurs inside of social institutions. It is dialogic. It takes place as between people by way of human interactions, the family, community, school, peer group. It is inside these cultural institutions of human association where development is achieved. Resources essential to human de development, the attention that a parent gives to her child, for instance, are not alienable. Developmental resources, for the most part, are not commodities. The development of human beings is not up for sale. Rather, networks of connections between people create the context within which developmental resources come to be allocated to individual persons. Opportunity travels along the synapses of these social networks. People are not machines. Their productivity, which is to say, the behavioral and cognitive capacities bearing on their social and economic functioning, these things are not merely the result of a mechanical infusion of material resources. Rather, these capacities are the byproducts of social interactions mediated by human affiliation and connectivity. This was fundamentally important, I thought, and still think, for understanding persistent racial disparities in America. This is the first point I was making all those years ago about the incompleteness of human capital theory. My second observation was that what we are calling race in America is mainly a social and only indirectly a biological phenomenon. The persistence across generations of racial differentiation between large groups in an open society where people live in close proximity to one another provides irrefutable indirect evidence of a profound separation between the racially defined networks of social affiliation in that society. For there would be no races in the steady state of any dynamical social system unless on a daily basis and in regard to their most intimate affairs, people paid assiduous attention to the boundaries separating themselves from racially distinct others. This is so because over time race would cease to exist unless people were acting so as biologically to reproduce the variety of phenotypic expression that constitutes the substance of racial distinction. I cannot overemphasize the second sociological point. We speak casually about racial equality, racial justice, and so on. And yet race is not something simply given in nature. Rather, it is socially produced. It is something that we are making. That there exist distinct races is an equilibrium phenomenon. It's endogenous. It follows that if the goal is to understand the roots of durable racial inequality in any society, we must examine in some detail those processes causing race to persist as a fact in that society. Almost certainly, such processes will not be unrelated to the allocation amongst individuals of human developmental resources. Here then is my second observation in a nutshell. We economists need to recognize the limits of our tools to account for durable economic disparities by race. The creation and reproduction of such inequality ultimately rests on cultural conceptions that people hold about identity and about the desire, desirability and the legitimacy of conducting intimate social relations with racially distinct others. And here I do not only mean sexual relations. Racial inequality is not just a disparity of material resources. Most fundamentally, it is rooted in the decisions all of us are making about with whom to associate and with whom to identify. Such anyway was the gist of my argument. The contrast that I drew in my doctoral thesis all those years ago between human and social capital was grounded in my conviction that such decisions determine the access people enjoy to the informal resources they require to develop their human potential. My argument was that social capital is an essential prerequisite for the acquisition of what economists refer to as human capital. And we know, we economists, that human capital, 
a person's skills, education, work experience, and social aptitudes is a key determinant of a person's earnings power and of his or her capacity to generate and to accumulate wealth. The resources people need for their development are not all commodities acquired through markets as a result of formal transactions, I reiterate. Access to some vital resources are embedded in a person's social situation. For instance, the resource of a mother's attention to her health when her child is in the womb, or the resource of peers with whom one associates and internalizes the things they valorize, which then become important things shaping the choices one makes about the acquisition of skills, or the information one has about what is possible for one to achieve that derives from connections to others who have explored those possibilities. These things are all factors or inputs into skills production, but they are not commodities. A financial deficit does not fully reflect a deficit of these things. This was the idea I wanted to employ to give an account of durable racial inequality, even after eliminating most discrimination. Now, when I wrote that dissertation, it was the mid-1970s, a decade beyond the big civil rights laws and quite early in this era of relatively fair market opportunities for people irrespective of race. Now, the post-civil rights era is more than a half century old. Obviously, perfect equality of treatment has not been achieved, but it is a relatively level playing field now in terms of the valuation of skills. We need to account for the disparities in the acquisition of skills. So we can ask whether the racial disparities history has produced will necessarily wither away under this new dispensation. My answer is no, they need not because the labor, credit, housing, and product markets are not the whole show. Also important are peers neighborhoods and communities, the structure of families, the nature of values and norms, the notions of identity, the social resources, who you're connected to, who you can call upon, who influences you, who informs you. These things matter. Books in the home matter. Whether the children are read to matters. When does a parent turn off the television set matters. I suggest that we use this social capital concept as a tool for thinking about racial inequality and its remedies. Doing so disciplines our thinking to appreciate the limits of regulatory control when the developmental outcomes of interest are the byproduct of non-market processes. It shifts the conversation somewhat away from a purely redistributive focus to a relational focus. Please understand, I'm not saying that people without money have no need of it. I'm saying that money is not the only thing they need. Talking in this way is not blaming the victim. Oppressed groups time and again evolve notions of identity that cut against the mainstream. A culture can develop among them, inhibiting youngsters from taking actions needed to develop their talent. Now I ask, do kids in a segregated dysfunctional peer group simply have the wrong utility functions? I think it is a mistake to attribute the dysfunctional behavior such as it may be of an historically oppressed group of people to their simply having the wrong preferences when those preferences quite clearly have emerged from a set of historical experiences that reflect the larger societies, structures, and activities. But by the same token, it is a grievous error to ignore the consequences of such behavior or to pretend it doesn't exist as many, many anti-racism advocates are now doing. Citing structural racism can't plausibly account for what's going on. For so long as race is a meaningful part of people's identity in a society, and when they reproduce those meanings via their patterns of association over time, then we must expect to see differences in the network structures in which people are embedded. Then, if network-mediated spillovers in the processes of human capital development are important, you're going to see persisting racial inequality. The behavioral issues affecting Black communities are real and must be faced squarely if we are to grasp why racial disparities persist. The young men who are killing each other on the mean streets of Baltimore, Minneapolis, St. Louis, and Chicago are self-evidently behaving abominably. Those bearing the cost of such behavior are mainly other Black people. 
An ideology that ascribes this behavior to racism cannot be taken seriously. No one really believes it, I maintain, not really. Or consider educational test score data. Structural racism advocates are in effect daring you to say that some groups are represented at elite universities and outsized numbers compared to others because their academic preparation is magnitudes higher and better and finer. They're daring you to credit such excellence as an achievement. Yet no one is born knowing these things. Such knowledge must be acquired through effort. Now, why some youngsters have acquired these skills, why others have not? That is a deep and interesting question, one which I am quite prepared to entertain at length. But the simple retort racism is profoundly unserious, as though such behaviors have nothing to do with cultural patterns as such disparities have nothing to do with behavior, with cultural patterns, with the things that communities and peer groups value, with how people choose to spend their time, with what they identify as being critical to their own self-respect. Asians, it is said sardonically, are a model minority. Well, as a matter of fact, a compelling case can be made that culture is critical to their success. Don't take my word for it. Read Jennifer Lee and Min Zhou's book, the Asian American Achievement Paradox. There, they interviewed Asian families in Southern California trying to learn how these kids get into Dartmouth and Columbia and Cornell at such high rates. What they find is that these families do in fact exhibit cultural patterns, embrace values, adopt practices, engage in behavior and follow disciplines that orient them so as to facilitate the achievements of their children. It defies common sense as well as the evidence to assert that they do not, or conversely, to assert that the paucity of African-Americans performing at the very top of the intellectual spectrum, I'm talking here about excellence and about the relative the low numbers of African-Americans who exhibit it, has nothing to do with the behaviors of Black people, that such an outcome is due entirely to institutional forces. That, quite frankly, is an absurdity. Again, I maintain that no one could really believe it. Or consider this, does anyone really believe that 70% of black American babies being born to a woman without a husband is a good thing or is due to anti-black racism? How could a serious person think so? People say it, but I doubt that they believe it. In effect, they are bluffing. They're daring you to observe that the 21st century failures of some African-Americans to take full advantage of the opportunities created by the 20th century's revolution of civil rights are palpable and damning. Yet these failures are being denied at every turn. And I maintain, again, that this is not a tenable position. The end of Jim Crow segregation and the advent of equal rights for Black Americans were game changers that now a half century down the line, we continue to face these disparities is shameful. It is a national, not merely a communal disgrace, I acknowledge, but the plain fact of the matter is that some responsibility for this sorry state of affairs lies in part with the behaviors of black people ourselves. The structural racism crusaders refuse to acknowledge this. All of this is deeply problematic and ultimately contrary to the interest of black people rightly understood. When agency is taken away from a people, they lose the possibility of holding themselves to account and the capacity to maintain judgment and standards by means of which they can evaluate what they do. If a youngster who happens to be black has no choice about whether to join a gang, pick up a gun or become a criminal because well, because society has failed him by not providing adequate housing, health care, income support, job opportunities, and so forth, then soon enough it will become impossible to discriminate as between those Black youngsters who do and do not behave in this way. It becomes impossible, that is, to maintain within Black American society the judgments of our fellows' behavior needed in order to affirm our own expectations of right living because so goes the narrative, we're all supposed to be victims of anti-Black racism. We're all suffering a common lack of agency, a lack of control over our lives, a lack of accountability for what we do. What is more, there is a deep irony in first declaring America to be systemically and essentially racist 
and then mounting a campaign to demand that white America acknowledge their racism and act so as to deliver us from its consequences. For if indeed you are right that your oppressors are racist, why would you expect them to respond to your moral appeals? You are in effect putting yourself on the mercy of a court while simultaneously decrying that this court is intrinsically biased. Many structural racism arguments have this quality, preaching that American society is so unrelentingly determined to deny the humanity of Black people that we must never lose sight of the fact that we are hated, hunted as a species of humans. Don't believe the American dream, they say. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't buy the narrative. Don't believe the hype. This is an extremely disempowering idea. I want to now shift the gears a little bit and talk about reparations to Black Americans. It's a big issue, and I'm against it. I want to just give some flavor of what it is that I'm concerned about, which I think will reveal something of my larger outlook. I'm against it for a couple of reasons. First, I will note that when the Japanese Americans who had been interred by the Roosevelt administration during World War II were finally in an act of Congress signed into law by Ronald Reagan, officially acknowledged to have been wrongly victimized. They were offered a token reparations payment. It was $20,000 a head, and it went out to 80,000 people, people who had actually been interred in camps. That's $1.6 billion paid out of the US Treasury as well it should have been paid. By contrast, there are 35 to 40 million African Americans. If we take 40 acres and a mule as a benchmark and we bring it forward at a normal rate of return, we're in the many tens of thousands of dollars per head. Call it 100,000 a head, that's $4 trillion. That is, we have 40 million people receiving $4 trillion as compared with 80,000 people receiving $1.6 billion. Here's my point. To pay reparations to Black Americans would require creating a social security magnitude fiscal program in America based upon racial identity. That is a mistake for this society. It's South Africa-esque. It would mean classifying people, enacting statutes, laws, and administrative practices based upon a citizen's race. America ought not to go down that path, even if the courts would allow it, about which I have my severe doubts. Of course, people are going to differ with that opinion, but such is the moral argument that I'd like to make. But I also have a practical argument about reparations, which is that African Americans do have a problem, do have many problems in some of our communities, for sure. We could enumerate them. I've already hinted at that. These problems are going to be with us for a while. They won't be going away overnight, and they appropriately deserve a sympathetic engagement by the polity as a whole. Dealing with these problems, which I admit are in part a consequence of our history of slavery and Jim Crow, will require an open-ended commitment. So in my view, it would not be the smartest thing in the world to cash our position out, so to speak, via transaction wherein Black people sit on one side of the metaphorical bargaining table with our moral capital and America is on the other side of that table. And a transaction is in effect negotiated by means of which this debt is discharged. I do not want to commodify that tacit obligation. Rather, I would argue what we should do is take our chips and put them with the larger political initiatives that are aimed at creating a decent society here in the United States for everyone, whether that be on behalf of healthcare or housing or food security or employment or preschool education or old age security and so forth. I'm talking here about building out the American welfare state. Where it's sufficiently robust on behalf of everybody, most of the concerns that we have about racial disparities would be ameliorated, and we Blacks will have lent our moral capital to a righteous cause, not a racially defined reparation, but instead a humanistically defined improvement in the social contract broadly understood. Now, Having gotten myself into hot water enough, I think I'll 
say a few words about affirmative action. Because the court is going to be hearing these cases in the current term, and we'll see what the court decides. But I will observe that we're 50 years down the line with these policies, a half century. It's a long time. Racial preferences have become institutionalized. And that causes me to have a concern. And let me just voice it directly. Equality of representation in the most rarefied venues of competitive selection is ultimately inconsistent with equality of respect when there are different performance levels between the populations in question. I'm talking about selection at the right tail, not talking about selection at the median of a population. I'm talking about the 95th percentile. My point is that there's going to be a post-selection difference in performance of students by race if one has used different pre-selection criteria when choosing them, so long as those pre-selection criteria actually correlate with post-selection performance. If these criteria, standardized tests, let's say, previous grades, advanced placement enrollments, quality of a writing sample or whatever. If these indicia of qualification are not correlated with performance, then they should not be used at all when they have a disparate impact on a historically disadvantaged group. But presumably such criteria are being used precisely because we all know that they are in fact correlated with post performance to some degree. That's why we use them to select among applicants who are all in the same racial group because we're looking for those who are the most promising applicants and because the criteria in question are the best information we have about that question. The context, if a graduate education, perhaps we're talking about the GREQ. If an undergraduate education, perhaps, perhaps we're talking about the SAT verbal. The context may vary. Uh, it won't be the same everywhere, but the criteria in question to the extent that they are correlated tell us something about how those being selected will perform after the fact. Now, if you use different cutoffs, and I invite you to look at the data produced in discovery in the Harvard case, for example, to see the huge disparities in the indices of academic preparation characteristic of applicant populations by race to that university. That's just one window on this reality. It's somewhat opaque because institutions are not forthcoming with their data. We have different criteria of selection. They're going to be different post-selection performance if the criteria are correlated. These are large samples. This is the law of large numbers. It's inescapable. What's the consequence of that? We're in the right tail now. Remember, we're selecting elites. The consequence of using racial preferences to promote representation of the disadvantaged in venues of high selectivity, I claim, is that either we acknowledge these differences in post admissions performance or we don't. We cover them up by flattening our assessment criteria. We pretend that they're not there. This dishonesty can be stifling. My claim is that right tail selection plus racially preferential selection is ultimately inconsistent with true racial equality. It'll get you representation but it will not get you to true equality, that is to an equality of dignity, of respect, of standing, of belonging. You need something closely approximating parity of performance to get that kind of equality. But you've selected with racially differential standards into an activity which is highly competitive and elite, where it is known in advance that the criteria are correlated with post-selection performance. As a result, you end up with racial disparities in performance after selection that you don't own up to. Thus, consider academic economics. There are not enough black economists, I agree. We should be diverse and inclusive, I agree. Of the top 20 departments in the country, there should be at least two at every one of them. Okay, I'll agree to that. And they're not, we gotta do better. I agree to that. Maybe I can agree with all of that, but if the way you're going to do better is to make criteria of selection into this rarefied enterprise of academic economics at the frontier in the top departments, dependent upon racial identity, you're not going to get equality. What you're going to get is Black mediocrity to some degree. Now, 
I know that it's unspeakable to say that there could be racial differences in performance, but I get letters in my inbox all the time. I'm a partner at a big law firm in New York. Here's what I can't say publicly. Please don't quote me. Many of our associates are of color and are not up to snuff, but we hired them because, well, because some of them are gonna make partner here and I shudder at that prospect. I've heard people say that. Now here's what we ought to do instead. We ought to devote our effort to enhancing the development of African-American prospects such that when you apply roughly equal criteria of selection at the right tail, the numbers you get increase. We ought not to aim for population parity. That's a huge mistake. These numbers, various group shares of the available positions have to add up to one after all. How can you expect population parity in an enterprise when there are some groups that are overrepresented by a factor of two or three relative to their population. I don't have to name these groups. We all know who they are. You can't get population parity with equal criteria of selection when all the populations are not feeding in at the same rate in every activity. It's a mistake to try. I conclude that the permanent embrace of preferential selection by race in, in extremely competitive and rarefied venues is a historic error. I can understand the transitional use in the early years of the civil rights and, uh, revolution and so on, historically speaking, but this institutionalization of preferences by race is inconsistent with genuine racial equality. Indeed, I would go so far as to argue that achieving parity between identity-based groups and society ought not to be a public policy goal at all. There's a fatal contrib contradiction at the heart of the argument for group equality of social outcomes. In my considered opinion, we ought not to expect this. We ought not to be trying to achieve it. Equality of opportunity, not equality of results, is the only defensible public policy. The dogged pursuit of equal results between racial groups across all venues of human endeavor is a formula for tyranny and yet more racism. Here's why. Identitarian arguments for group equality posit the existence of different groups, Jews, South Asians, East Asians, Blacks, Latinos, et cetera, and also affirms that these groups have identities which deserve to be acknowledged and respected. When someone tells me I identify as a member of group X, I am given to understand that this is a part of their personhood which warrants to be respected and given credence. So groups are fundamental building blocks of society in this identity focused view of the world. It's not a matter of indifference which group one belongs to. We're in these various boxes, groups matter. A group's culture and heritage matter to its members, the music they listen to, the food they eat, the literature they read, the stories they tell their children. All of these things for the identitarians are important and they all vary across groups. On the other hand, group egalitarians presuppose that absent injustice, there would be an equality of groups across every human enterprise. But how can that be? Because if groups matter, some people are gonna bounce a basketball 100,000 times a month and other people are gonna bounce it 10,000 times a month. Some people are gonna be drawn to books as a way of experiencing human culture and other people are gonna be more verbal and more spontaneous or whatever it might be. There are differences between groups. Groups matter after all. They are not all the same. They don't have the same, do the same things. They don't believe the same things. They don't think the same things. They don't spend their time in the same way. So now I have population groups that have their own integrity, expressing themselves in how they live, how they raise their children, how they spend their time. This will inevitably result in different representation of the group's members across various human activities. The various group's members will not all be involved in academic pursuits. They won't all be as much immersed in the business world, in the professions, in sports or entertainment to the same extent. They'll not all have the same occupational and professional profiles. If groupness matters for the identitarians, then this groupness must be reflected to some degree in how people choose to live their lives. How then can egalitarians insist that society is unfair unless it yields an equal proportionate representation of groups in every human enterprise? This is simply a logical contradiction. Acting in a determined way on that contradiction can only lead to tyranny, to disappointment, to conflict, and to more racism.
For if we try to erase those cultural and behavioral distinctions that constitute the substance of groupness, putting everyone in one social milieu, overriding the autonomy of parents, socializing child rearing and so on, then we might be able to flatten the social terrain enough to achieve group equality, but to do this would be tyrannical. It would extinguish our freedom as individual persons to associate with each other, to believe and to live as we please. And should such a draconian policy fail to produce group equality as seems more than likely, we would end up with the question, how come there are so many Jews or Asians or whites or whatever in medical school with PhDs in electrical engineering at the top of the income distribution? That is where identity-based group egalitarian ultimately leads. There is no end to the quest for group equality if indeed group identities are meaningful and persistent. The presumption of group equality in the face of group distinctions of social organization, culture, and values leads either to a tyrannical imposition of uniform standards in a vain attempt to tamp down the authentic expressions of groupness or to endless finger pointing and suspicion whenever some group of people moves ahead or falls behind the pack in this or that arena of achievement a treacherous presumption will haunt society, that any disparity must reflect systemic unfairness. That is a formula for perpetual conflict, not for social justice. And it is a temptation we should resist. Let me conclude. It's true that we Black Americans have been dealt a bad hand by history. However, that undeniable fact does not tell us how to live how to move forward or what to do. Life is full of tragedy and atrocity and barbarity. Life is not fair. The hard truth of the matter I have argued here is that we Black Americans have no alternative but to take up responsibility for our lives and to embrace the burdens of our freedom. No one is coming to save us. This, I say, is not fair, but it is true nonetheless. If we want to walk with dignity, if we want to be truly equal, we must realize that white people cannot give us equality. We actually have to earn it. Please don't be angry with me because I'm on the side of Black people here. Still, I must insist that equality of dignity and standing and respect and security of one's position within society, of the ability to command the recognition of others, these are things that in the nature of the case, cannot be handed over to a group of people in response to political protest. These things must be wrested with one's bare hands from a cruel and indifferent world. We will have to make ourselves equal because no one can do it for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Glenn. Um, that was extremely uh, question inducing, by the way. We have a, a long list of questions. I'm gonna ask the first one. So there's people out there that say race is a completely meaningless concept. Uh, there's yours, which is that you said from your dissertation, which is race is real, but endogenous. If we all randomly selected who we had babies with, then within a few generations, race would not exist. But then there's also the question I get personally, uh, people saying that we don't as economists consider race enough. I've taught the equivalent of Econ 101, Econ 102 I'm currently teaching. It is simply not in the syllabus at all. How do you think economists should be approaching race? Are we approaching it wrong, approaching it not enough, obsessing about it too much? Well, I mean, I think we have a pretty stick-figured view of the human person, don't we? We economists, we have machines of maximizing of value or, or happiness or whatever. The, the notion of meaning, of identity, doesn't play much of a role in our account of human behavior. Uh, so th that's where I would try to begin if I were going to be writing an elementary textbook and someone asked me how to bring race into the picture. I mean, it wouldn't just be race in terms of, uh, you know, skin color and hair texture and so on. It would be race and ethnicity and identity. Um, and there would be a heavy dose of network analysis about how people make choices about whom to connect with and so on. Uh, 
uh, the human capital spillovers, well, I'm referring to my talk now, but uh, the, the technology of the production of skills in which it depends a lot who you're uh, affiliated with and so on would matter. Um, but I, I don't think biological race, you know, um, uh, I think of people like Charles Murray, uh, his book, Human Diversity, uh, his uh, analysis of uh, differences in uh, contemporary populations of people who descend from geographically isolated historic uh, uh, branches of, of the human family in Northeast Asia or in Southern Europe or in Sub-Saharan Africa or in the Americas and so on. This, this kind of idea about race, um, I frankly don't think has much of a role in the economic stories that we would be telling. But race as identity, uh, race as a choice of uh, of a uh, source of meaning in one's life is the narratives that I embrace about, uh, you know, my my history, who who is close to me and who I feel affiliated with. Uh, I I think might be a more fruitful path. I'm sorry if I don't measure up to the introductory textbook standards, but it's a hard job writing introductory textbook in any field. I think. Okay, so now I'm going to go to lists of questions. We've got a lot. Yeah. Um, Here's one. Here at the University of Minnesota, we've got demographers and public health scholars working hard on big projects, trying to speci specify, operationalize, measure, and assess different elements of structural racism and their impacts on racially unequal health outcomes. Uh, what do you think of, so that's another, I mean, that's a different social science thing, trying to understand the relationship between what is called structural racism, structural racism and unequal health outcomes as opposed to unequal uh, economic outcomes. Well, okay, I'm gonna confess not to knowing a whole lot about, about the health issues. Um, I, and, and I wanna acknowledge that there is fruitful, uh, there's, a, there's a fruitful area of inquiry to try to understand how systemic forces might have consequences that generate or exacerbate differences between racial groups. Um, for example, I don't, again, know a whole lot about the health issues, but I do know a little bit of something about the criminology issues. And it was a predictable consequence of ratcheting up the uh, war on drugs and the anti-drugs trafficking enforcement regime, which happened in uh, you know, post uh, 1980 in the United States, a predictable consequence of having done so, that uh, of those people who ended up being uh, incarcerated, disproportionate number of them were gonna come from poor and black urban communities. Predictable because the dynamics of the uh, open air marketing in uh, the illicit commerce, who is gonna be uh, recruited, quote unquote, into the, foot soldier work of that kind of business. It's dangerous, it's low paying. These are gonna be people whose alternative opportunities are scant. You're gonna end up disproportionately with disadvantaged people on the selling side. Then if you have a regime that comes down hard on people who are selling drugs, you're gonna end up with a lot of black people greater than their numbers in the population, greater than their numbers amongst those who are drug users being, uh, being dragged into the uh, 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 orbit of the criminal justice system. You could call that structural racism. In fact, you have a colleague there, I think he's still around, Michael Tonry, uh, who's written a whole book about this. The criminologist Michael Tonry, he's at the law school at Minnesota. His book is called uh, Benign, I'm sorry, Malign Neglect. Malign Neglect is the book, and the argument of the book is when Reagan and company ramped up the war on drugs, they could have and should have known that they were going to end up criminalizing a whole lot of poor black people. They went ahead and did it anyway, uh, either uh, by uh, error of omission or commission, they perpetrated a crime, at, quote unquote, against black people in doing so. This would, uh, if you wanted to have a, uh, the label structural racism put on something, you could put it on that. Now, I can imagine in the health area that people are going to say things like, for example, what about environmental hazards? that where people located within the metropolitan area, given how the housing market is gonna work, 
you know, if New Orleans gets flooded, the people at the highest elevation are going to be the least impacted. The people at the lowest elevation are going to be the most impacted. The rent gradient is going to be up for higher. If you have lower income, you're going to be living lower. Those are going to be more disproportionately minority people and so on. Um, so on like that, you could talk about stress. Uh, if you're in an environment in which there is a antipathy toward people of your kind, Black people suffering from racism, uh, passive or active, uh, they may internalize to some degree the consequences of these stressful environments, and that may militate negatively on their health. And you could call that structural racism if you want to. Uh, I'm not going to argue about the word. Uh, so what am I trying to say here? I'm trying, first of all, to demonstrate that I appreciate the value of uncovering perhaps not obvious social and political and economic and structural and geographic and environmental processes that help to perpetuate African-American disadvantage. There is work to be done there. I didn't mean to make light of that. I was talking about the rhetorical and casual use of the catch-all structural racism phrase when I thought it possible to offer a more detailed account. And I'll concede I was being a little bit polemical. So my apologies to people who may have made their life's work the uncovering of otherwise not obvious processes that have the effect of disadvantaging African-Americans, because I acknowledge that they exist. OK, thank you. Here's the next question. It's about the, the Black-white wealth gap. So the Black-white wealth gap is about 1 to 10. The medium white American family has about 10 times the wealth of the medium black family. Children born into these families are at a distinct opportunity uh, disadvantage. How can a gap so large lead you to conclude we start from a relatively equal starting point? No, what I said was that we're starting with a level playing field or a fair system of rewarding skills. I know we don't start from an equal starting point, and it's not only wealth that reflects the fact that we don't start from an equal starting point. I assure you, 70% of kids born to a woman who's not married, which is a product of history, complex as it is, is not an equal starting point for the kids in those households who are deprived of the support that they need to foster their development. But I would say this about, well, first of all, I would not take the ratio of medians. The denominator is going to be a small number, and we're going to get a 10 to 1 ratio I, we have the whole distribution. Let's look at the whole distribution. I'm not disputing the fact that the distribution of wealth holdings by race are equal. What I'm disputing is 10 to 1 by taking a ratio of medians is a statistic that I, that I think is an accurate depiction of the reality. Uh, a lot of people don't have wealth. A lot of white people don't have wealth. Uh, the other thing I'd say is uh, I would take stocks and flow seriously. This is economics talk. Wealth is a stock. Income is a flow. The stock evolves over time under the influence of what people do about the flows. The issue here to me is what will be the steady state wealth holdings and how will it be changed by introducing any particular policy? If I have a reparations policy motivated by what I take to be the questioner's outlook, which is that we're not starting with an equal playing field, let's make the playing field equal. And so we have some transfers of wealth. That doesn't end the discussion. We then start the clock running and we look at the dynamic evolution of wealth holdings over a period of time and we take that out. We economics modelers would wanna take that out to the asymptote and we would wanna ask about how under the influence of people's decisions about the management of their wealth, about the acquisition of additional wealth, about their income, about their savings, about their investment patterns and so forth and their consumption patterns, uh, what we would expect to see. Uh, that's an exercise that most people don't in, engage in when they just imagine that the impact of history can be nullified uh, by making transfers. So, no, I don't say we start on a level, play, level playing field. I say history has dealt us a, a bad hand. I, I, I reiterate, though, my view that a policy of massive racially defined wealth transfers in the United States would be a disaster for our country. Okay. I think I got about time for one, one more question, and that means that there's a huge number of questions that are not getting uh, answered, but that's the nature of these types of events. Uh, perhaps in the future, 
we'll have as part of the public life project something that discusses these issues. So somebody asks a question regarding individual versus, I, I'd like to know your intellectual structure for handling the difference between individual and circumstances, individual behavior and circumstances. So this person writes, do you think the negative behaviors of black people you mentioned, killing each other in the streets, joining gangs, et cetera, are at least partially due to the history of oppression against black people? Take redlining, for instance, uh, which might be a cause of the wealth differences because you can't build up your, your wealth and housing. Um, how do you make the distinction between group differences and outcomes that are caused by individual behavior and group differences and outcomes that are due to uh, circumstances like redlining and so forth? Well, I, these are empirical questions that have to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, we could ask hypothetically, uh, it, it's a counterfactual, right? I mean, the, the, the exercise that's invited here is to, to try to figure out, but for that, where would we be? But for redlining, where would we be? Now, again, this is not something I'm an expert on, but I have uh, been, you know, as a, someone interested in these general questions, uh, acquainting myself with some of the writing about it. And my understanding, uh, for example, is that with respect to uh, the redlining issue, uh, there were an awful lot of whites who were also in areas that were designated as being, um, you know, uh, underwritten, risky, or low priority investments for loans. It, it wasn't only a racial policy. So, I'm, I'm, I, I frankly think that the the claim that but for redlining there would be uh, a substantial uh, change in contemporary wealth holdings among blacks remains to be demonstrated to my satisfaction. Uh, the racial disparities in wealth holdings would have to, if you were going to do the counterfactual analysis that I'm suggesting, take on board the fact that white wealth, as well as black wealth, were adversely affected by red wine lining policies on the observation that people living in areas that were redlined were uh, also white. In, in fact, I think uh, substantially more of them were white than black. But I, but I don't want to get mired down into the details. I want to acknowledge that, you know, history casts a long shadow. Of course, that's true. Um, it doesn't answer the question to observe that, uh, for example, behavioral patterns, maybe the family structure issues that I were calling to, was calling attention to, were influenced by history. It doesn't answer the question of what to do about them now. Um, pointing out historical causation doesn't give me uh, a, uh, a recipe for how to manage a con contemporary uh, situation. If we're looking for uh, blame to assign, I'm quite prepared to put a lot of the responsibility for the conditions that I was uh, lamenting on uh, the history of racism and uh, anti-Black uh, behavior. I'm, that's okay with me. I, I, I'm not, like I said, it's not blaming the victim to observe that these things are the case. But having said that, having said, for example, that this is on the argument of people like Orlando Patterson, the sociologist at Harvard, um, who talks about, uh, he's got a book, Slavery and Social Death, where he talks about the uh, history of slavery in the United States, amongst other things. And uh, he, he believes strongly that uh, the family structure issues in contemporary African-American society can be traced to what he calls natal alienation which was a feature of the regime of African slavery in the United States, the separating of bonds between the generations within family and so on, because the master could sell off the children or he could rape uh, the, the woman who is the mother of the children or whatever it might be. And the, the pressures of slavery on African-American family dynamic, so goes an argument, are, uh, have their fingerprints on the contemporary situation. That well might be true. It is of very little value in prescribing what it is that one does about it or in assessing the contemporary consequences of that historical legacy. Okay. Well, Professor Lowry, 
We've reached our time limit. This has been an extraordinarily uh, interesting and provocative hour. Uh, so I'm simply going to give you my great thanks for sharing it with us. Uh, I do want to thank the, uh, the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance, uh, my own department, and the Public Life Project. So the Public Life Project is a effort by the College of Liberal Arts to try to create conversations where people who disagree greatly on things are able to discuss them politely and get progress. Because I mean, this is something that Professor Lowry has, has talked about. We, and we have to be very good about thinking of all ourselves as being in the common, we need to create mechanisms to discuss things productively. And I think this has been a perfect example of that. And so again, thank you so much, Professor Lowry. My pleasure.